Well, I was asked to talk about color in ancient Egypt, and I've tried to narrow this down a little bit. Um, and uh, so I want to make some very basic points about color before running through many things. Uh, and the first obvious point is that the world is colored. But even if you talk to a visual um, a specialist in uh, neuroimaging, uh, I mean, neuro, a, a neuropsychologist, they will say, well, color is, is, it doesn't really exist. So color is always a problem. And we have to say that pictorial representation doesn't necessarily require color. Nonetheless, things are not complete without color. So there are paradoxes in color, and it's important to think about that because when we think about things that are done in paint or other plainly colored materials, it's different from working in metal. But I'm certain my first image shows you uh, not maybe the oldest example of this extraordinary glass that was produced in the Greek or Roman period, um, but an early example anyway, showing that there is a, an extraordinary interest in both in color and in detail. And it, there's a miniaturization that happens. And this is a tradition that then continues in the... Is this wrong? Yes, uh, this, this tradition then continues in the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. Uh, and it is an indigenous Egyptian tradition, although we don't know where the technology for the, this uh, glass came, but it's not only in glass. And it, it is good to have a contrast with um, other forms of Egyptianizing in the Roman world. Uh, so this is clearly not nothing to do with what we're talking about today. This is Egyptianizing, yes, but it uses the conventions of classical art. Uh, we must also think that this was an intensely colored world. Uh, here we have a statue, a, a classical Greek statue, and it's purely white, how people have tended since the late Renaissance to think about classical art. But here is how it has been reconstructed as being. I don't like those colors, uh, but they are very vivid, and we have to remember that we were in a very vividly colored world. And then we have the color of metal, which is often very confusing. I have a Chinese example here. So here we have these two beakers, which, and almost all the Chinese bronzes you ever see look like the next image. Uh, they are green, roughly, but Actually, they were intended to be, in quotes, gold in color. Uh, but it happens uh, that they don't survive that way, ex uh, except in an extraordinary context. And uh, people do not have the habit of cleaning them into the, the original forms. So we have all these criteria we need to take into account. Uh, going back to Egypt, we have traditions of marrying metal with color from early. These are perhaps the oldest clear examples we would have from Hetaperis. And in this case, stone or multiple colored stones are inlaid into silver, silver being a rare material in that period. Uh, so we should assume that the ambition to use metal with color was intrinsic to the way the Egyptians treated these things always. Uh, we also have evidence, uh, this is rather exceptional evidence here, uh, of how um, you could focus on particular colors and you could also use, uh, these are dummy vessels, but they were obviously of the very highest value and they have gold as a major component, and also blue. And blue was not a color that was intrinsic to Egyptian color terminology, um, but it, it was important from an early date. Uh, the latest evidence says that the oldest examples of Egyptian blue, the artificial pigment, are prehistoric. Um, but uh, 
there's just one article about that subject. By the, by the date of these vessels, um, it was still quite rare, and often you have substitutions of colors because blue was not either not available or restricted in use or something of that sort. Well, then we can see color appearing in, uh, in jewelry uh, in particular. And here you have the idea of inlaying metals with multiple colors. Uh, and that the colors there are broadly speaking the Egyptian four color terminology, except that there is a very prominent presence of blue, which is outside the terminology. Uh, but the red um, flesh color of the king there is very clear. Uh, and uh, so jewelry is something which could have carried a lot of uh, tradition with it. Uh, then we have, uh, this is an early work of Howard Carter, the illustration is. Um, uh, you have this axe of, uh, from the tomb of Ahotep, uh, and that has the axe blade on one side. Let's have the detail. Um, uh, one side is uh, inlaid with stones and artificial materials, and clearly the Egyptians bring these two possibilities together. And then the other side is very largely not inlaid that way, but is maybe patinated or treated in such a way. Uh, experts can say more about that. Uh, and it's worth emphasizing how totally artificial this is because the textile-like webbing or basket-like webbing on that axe is made of gold um, threads and so could never have had any function. Um, so these are very exceptional display pieces, which is appropriate for the Mensa Isiaka. Uh, we can then think about how colors are, I'm going through very fast through historical periods here with what I see as relevant examples. Uh, here you have an image of the king, King Tutmose III, uh, who is um, confronted by Amun Amhab, and the background to the figure of the king is yellow. Now, that doesn't is not a representation of a real baldachin, which would be open, we suppose, but it is a representation of the idea that the king is surrounded by uh, by a golden aura that probably protects him. Uh, and, but that's only one possibility. Elsewhere in the same tomb, you have a yellow background to figures of Osiris. Osiris is, as often happens, he's uh, actually you can't see in the photograph whether that's blue or green, but it's one or other, probably green. And then the yellow background here signifies something. It, basically, I think it signifies gold. And so we have texts that would support that idea uh, where a temple is described and it is said that certain features of it are of, of gold and others of electrum. And the floor of the temple is said to be silver. These are very implausible statements if you take them literally but they probably refer to the aspiration to a perfect white and, and um, yellow or golden environment. And so use of pigment is, um, uh, is indirect as signifying other things. And of course, color has a wide range of sim symbolism in many ways. It's worth also pointing to the ceiling in that picture. So this was an extraordinarily brightly color, uh, colored environment that was created by Egyptian tombs. And we'll have other examples in a minute. So here you have the tomb of Haramhab. Um, and in this case, uh, you've got conventional uses of colors which re relate to the Mensa, uh, the goddess with a yellow skin, uh, the king with red, and Osiris green. But I really put that in because of the background. So in 
from the old kingdom on, you quite often get backgrounds of an artificial coloured character. And these stand outside the general colour conventions. Uh, you, you get ones that look sort of halfway to being grey, in this case, halfway to being blue. And you can see the distinction. If you look at the blue on the goddess's wig or on the king's armbands and compare it with the background blue, it's a little, a little different. So people are actually using shades as well as colours in subtle ways. Uh, it's also, you've also got the full blue on the plinth of the throne of Osiris. Well, that of course is in a tomb and people are not going to have had tombs as their archetypes for later uh, temples. But in temples, you seem to have rather simpler conventions in this case, you have a white background or an off-white, depending on what pigment was used. And then you have uh, Amon Re, who is blue, and the blue is picked up by the sky, too. And then the rich colour of all the hieroglyphs. It's worth pointing out to the king's, um, the king's cap, which in this case is shown yellow, as if it were perhaps gilded. Uh, but it, other examples have different colours. Well, as time goes along, the blue pigment, having been a rarity in earlier periods, became absolutely pervasive, and it must have been a, a very easy material to manufacture, but it still carried a high prestige. And you have here um, a, a ceiling in the Temple of Medinet Habu where you can see that blue is used, and that, that is reasonably logical. The ceiling represents the sky. Uh, but uh, the degree to which you get blue is shown you in the next example, which is nearby in the same building, um, where not only the ceiling, but also the columns are blue, uh, or are the painted blue, or largely blue with some other colours. Uh, so this emphasis on blue is something that we find in uh, as Egyptian history goes along and it becomes more and more prominent. It's not going to relate closely to the Mensa, I don't think. But we, um, we have to say that you get a very different range of evidence from the first millennium, uh, although it's a development from something like Medina Tabu, did I put a date? Uh, 13th century, 12th century BCE, sorry. Uh, and so we then can illustrate these, uh, these developments with these painted funeral stele, which survive in large numbers, but might have been unknown to people of later periods, where in this case, the goddess Nut is uh, on the left. She has uh, a blue body, but that body is actually a dress. Uh, and then she has green straps to her dress, which you can just see, and a green face. Uh, Th Thoth is green, so is Isis. And so you've got very un, um, unrealistic, if that is a meaningful way to put it, uh, unrealistic colours that must carry important symbolic associations as well as giving you groupings among the figures. Uh, the on the right, you've got the god Atom, represented blue, which is very rare. Um, and it probably has to do with, say, his context in the solar cycle or something like that. Well, contemporary, more or less, with those, you have these, which I'm, I'm embarrassed to say were shown yesterday, but so you're not getting everything new. Uh, and as it was pointed out, the left hand, the minute, which is, of course, a small object, um, is a premier example of very elaborate metal inlay, including relief on the figure of the child god. Uh, and the child god is also differently colored from the figure of Sekhmet, uh, uh, sorry, Bastet, the goddess. Um, and then you have Karamama as being the uh, prime example of a wonderfully inlaid statue from the same period. Uh, but we should remember that uh, bronze is very easy to recycle. And uh, so the proportion of these great works that survives cannot tell us anything about what, how many there were in antiquity. Uh, you also have 
the near total disappearance of statues in silver. Uh, and uh, this uh, statue here is uh, said to be, I, I've not seen it in, in person, it's said to have been sheathed in gold, but made of silver. And um, well, at 16 kilos, it's a lot heavier than uh, Karamama, but whether it's solid silver, I don't know. Uh, and this, this has been published as a cult statue, but it isn't necessarily that. It could simply be a very, uh, a very elaborate and expensive uh, votive offering uh, would be another possibility. But it is using all the, te the, the techniques except for metal inlay that we've been talking about. Uh, but it's worth emphasizing, of course, that uh, there were th thousands and thousands of bronze statuettes of more modest dimensions. The only one of those four that I show there uh, that is at all large is the head on the right, which is part of a composite statue. But the middle one I draw attention to particularly because it is fully modeled, for example, the kilt, uh, but the kilt is then covered with gold overlay. And the gold overlay is normally on a base of plaster. And so the modeling is obscured by the gilding. But the gilding is pervasive, even on pretty crude statuettes. And to give a sense of um, the size of all of this, um, 17,000 bronzes were found in the cachette at Karnak. Uh, so uh, bronze, uh, suddenly it seems, well, I'm probably wrong, but never mind. Uh, in the middle of the, of the first millennium, bronze exploded as something for votive dedications and presumably was not super expensive because you could have little bronzes this size, which were dedicated in temples, we suppose, by fairly ordinary people. That doesn't tell us anything about the upper end of the use of bronze, but it is important to bear it in mind. Well. What did a temple look like as we move down into the Ptolemaic period? Uh, there is the Temple of Philae, uh, as reproduced by David Roberts in the 1830s, when it's retained its paint. Uh, and you've got this intensely bluish upper part and then color on all the figures. And uh, so I have a third hand from Hermann Juncker, uh, when he went to work in the Temple of Philae around the uh, beginning of the 20th century, it still was very brightly colored. Uh, there's very little left in Greek or Roman temples that has good color preservation, with exceptions. Uh, th there's an example of a moderate color preservation at uh, the birth house at Edfu. Uh, and of course, that's very sheltered, it faces south. Uh, and it's under a colonnade. <clears throat> but the, our exceptions are uh, at Dandara in particular, where the ceiling was cleaned about nearly 20 years ago now and produced these wonderful paintings, which again have the focus on blue. Uh, and they will be representative of what was a total environment of color that was created. Uh, if we moved to the, to the outside of the Temple of Dendera. Of course, there is no color there at all now, but it was probably all painted brightly. And we must think about that as part of the impact. Or, and even if it, they never finished it, as in plenty of temples they didn't, uh, that was the intention. Uh, and in the Temple of Dendera here, I like Friedhelm, I have only a black and white photograph of um, a scene in the Temple of Dendera, but I would draw your attention to the throne of Hathor on the right, which has pretty much the same sort of patterning as on the Mensa Isiaka, and also the thrones of those deities on the left. The, the, uh, they're both figures of a manifestations of Horus, Horus of Bechtet and Horus, I can't quite read that hieroglyph. Uh, so you've, here you've got an important double way of doing your picture. So the color in this case is used to paint these extraordinary patterns on the plinths, 
But equally important is the very detailed carving of the figures. And that looks as if it may never have been painted. We, we can't be sure. Uh, but we can imagine that um, statues, in principle, those are images of cult statues. They've got their dimensions and material. It says they're made of wood and gold. Um, and the, the, so their dimensions are given. And uh, there are lots more pictures like this. Uh, and these statues were transported and were essential to the cult. And so they would have been a medium around which color was equally important. If we look at this um, much older example, it's, there's no color there. Um, that is the shrine, wooden shrine from Dar al uh, which uh, has reliefs on it. And that, I think, is a very important context to think about. The shrine that everyone knows is the golden shrine of Tutankhamun uh, from his tomb, which uh, is not directly relevant to us, I don't think, uh, but it emphasizes the great importance of the actual containers for cult images. And whether that shrine there was ever painted, we don't know. But it, because it was of Hatshepsut, the figures of Hatshepsut were erased, and so it was manipulated already in the first 20 years of its life, and uh, possibly then um, painting or, uh, was never done, or it was to be gilded, we just don't know. But we do have an example, which is very convenient, I think, in the form of this uh, um, <clears throat> this box here. So that is a shrine for a statue, uh, the statue, well, a statue is associated with that piece, uh, but whether it really went with it, I don't think we know. Uh, it, as far as I know, it's unpublished. It's in the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C. And you can see how it's, a, I think it's about this size. So it contains a relatively small statue. It is painted all over, and it is painted against, it is first plastered, and then it has yellow paint imitating gold or signifying gold, and then multicolored painting of the figures. And the, there's very little in the way of scenic decoration there, but not zero. And uh, you, can, um, you can think how uh, also you manipulate the significance of color, just a detail here, um, that uh, if you get that freeze there, Ant was freeze, uh, then, uh, sorry, I'm misinforming you, I, I think it's an Ant Jed was freeze, but it's difficult to see. Um, the black color, seeming black there, is probably an indication of a background. So there's a lot of, um, very subtle play at work in the use of color, even on a pretty modest object like this. Now, cult images were carried around in ancient Egypt. This object definitely comes from Egypt, not from the Greek or Roman world outside. And I would expect that in the Isis cult, as it spread throughout the Mediterranean and beyond, uh, there would have been cult images. They would have needed to be transported. These would have, have had scenic decoration on them, which would have been highly colored. And so the color conventions, which existed always, uh, then uh, continued and would have been accessible to some extent to specialized personnel. So people who could also have supplied a papyrus to the designer of the Men's Isaiah cup for the purpose of filling in the, of, of creating the hieroglyphic imitations. And uh, so this is a sort of context um, in, together with other papyrus forms of transmission, <clears throat> which I think could have influenced the composition as well as the use of color. But of course, we'll, there will be more discussions. So I don't want to go on with that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the use of color on the Mensa itself is, is very, very different. And we also have to think, I showed you Chinese examples about the color of the, of the base, the base color of the bronze in relation to the use of color on the figures. So I think I have said enough about that. I will just finish um, 
with, uh, I'll say one more thing about the Mensa, which is simply that a value attaching to the Mensa, I would suggest, was its extraordinary level of uh, execution. Um, it was a piece of the very highest prestige. Well, a slightly frivolous final example is the Apis Altar of Johann Melchior Dinglinger, which is much, much bigger than uh, the Mensa, and it uses more different materials in more different ways, and it was the one of the premier works of art of the early 18th century. Uh, and it, I always think it's good to see something like this, to realize that if you had a painting by Michelangelo, that was cheap compared to this. Uh, <clears throat> So this is the, what, what brings the highest prestige to the, the patron who commissions it, or actually it's more complicated. The, the jeweler wished to make it and he had to get a commitment from the patron before he could start work. But it is all for the glory of the ruler. Uh, there is um, August der Starke, uh, Augustus, King of Poland has his monogram on uh, the Apis altar. And of course, it relates to another point, which is that that cannot have had any utility. Uh, and uh, if you go to the Grunus Gewölbe, which is very much to be recommended, um, you will see in the same room there is the, um, the birthday celebration of the Shah Aurangzeb, also executed in the same materials, and that really can't have any utility. Uh, the coffee set can. Uh, uh, but be that as it may, I don't think we can easily see what a function for the Mensa Isiaka was because it was an object of such extraordinary uh, execution and prestige. It, it transcended any practical function it might have had. And so I will leave you with that little thought. Thank you very much for your patience. In the title of my presentation, I hit a pun that only those can understand without any explanation who can understand in Hungarian. The most directly refers uh, to the special scientific significance of the Egyed vessels. The Hungarian name of the find, as Egyedi Kincs, or as Egyedi Edények, has a double meaning in Hungarian, which is often confused by translators. This combination of words means, uh, on the one hand, that the find came from the village called Egyed, but also that it is unique. That is, uh, uh, there is not one more of it. In Hungarian language, the translation of the adjective unique is egyedi. The vessels of the so-called egyed treasure or cash are unique pieces of great beauty and significance. They belong to the collection of the Hungarian National Museum since almost 190 years. The two vessels with their richly inlaid black patinated surface and Egyptianizing decoration can be considered masterpieces of ancient metallurgy and still are unparalleled amongst the late Hellenistic and um, Roman copper alloy vessels. Next year, it will be 10 years since our joint study with Alessandra Jumnia Mir was published in Folia Archaeologica, an archaeological journal of the Hungarian National Museum. This study included the results of the first examination of vessels using complex modern technologies, including the determination of the composition of the vessels and their inlays. We managed to point, uh, point out uh, that both vessels were manufactured uh, of the famous Corinthium ice, that is artificially black patinated alloy of copper with small amount of gold, silver, and often arsenic and iron. The objects made of Corinthian alloy were work now luxury article in Roman times. Pliny the Elder states in his uh, Historia Naturalis, Sunt ego was a tantum Corinthia, that is therefore only vessels are real Corinthian wear. Up to now, under uh, the object scientifically identified as Corinthian alloy, apart from the edged vessels, there were not another examples of Vasa Corinthia. 
As early as 1833, Miklos Jankovic, who published the Egyed Vessels, recognized that the Jack closest analogous find is the Menza Isiaka, which, what an interesting parallel, was got into the Museo Egizio in 1832, uh, in the same year when the Egyed Vessels entered the collection of the Hungarian National Museum. His statement is still valid today because the similarity of the objects is surprising. The difference is that on the jug, the figures are uh, depicted with uh, golden wire inlaid in the black patinated metal, while on the mensa, they are uh, completely inlaid with uh, multicolored metal sheets. And there is another difference, which is uh, the extremely strong contrast between the lustreless black patinated background surface and the sparkling gold and silver inlays of the Egyed vessels. The Mensa Isiaka Symposium is uh, extremely important for us because it enables us to directly uh, get information on the actual results of the international research focused on the Mensa. Similarly, the symposium offers an excellent opportunity for us to present the latest research uh, of our research on the Egyed vessels. So I would like to express my special uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for the honorable invitation to join the symposium. My presentation aims uh, to briefly present uh, the unique Egyed vessels and give an overview of the recent results of the research. The cache was found accidentally by peasants in the vicinities of the village of Egyed, northwestern Hungary, on the land property of Count Vince Festetic in October 1831. At first, only the middle part of the jack came to light. The Count carried out a small scale excavation at the spot and recovered the other parts of the jack and other vessel, a dish with a handle and uh, as, well as, as well as some small finds among the fragmentary uh, bronze handle of a jug. Because of their function as uh, hand washing utensils and their Egyptianizing uh, decoration program, the jug and the dish were belonged together as a set. The exact find spot of the Egyed Kash is now still not identified. The Egyed estate belonged to the, to the Tolnai line of the Hungarian noble family of the Counts Festetic since um, 1742. In 1826, uh, when Ignaz Festetic died, the estate was divided among uh, his three sons, Sándor, Lajos and Vince. Vince was quite uh, prodigal, ran into debt, and in 1847 became insolvent. His son-in-law, Count Laszlo Batyányi, took his debt upon himself. His land property was transferred to Laszlo Batyányi in uh, 1852, after the death of Vince. So the key for the identification of the fine spot is the new owner, Count Laszlo Batyányi, who was the proprietor of Vince's part of heritage uh, under his death. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, two cadastral maps from uh, 1852 and 1856 have survived from Egypt. The uh, 1856 map calls several plots uh, of land north and northeast of the village of uh, village as uh, Laszlo Manor, which is 1852, still bore other names. This renaming is connected to the new landowner, Laszlo Batyányi, indicating that the land is owned by him. All this means that we managed to get one step closer to the location of the site of the vessels, which can be found to the north or northeast of the village of uh, Egyed. Because of uh, his poor financial uh, situation due to his frivolous way of life, Vince Festetic wanted to know if the vessels were made of gold or not. So right after they were found, he handed them over uh, to a goldsmith in Papa in order to answer this question. This goldsmith plunged the vessels into different type of acids, among them aqua regia, uh, that partly destroyed the inlays. The body of the jug also suffered serious damages. The name of the goldsmith who played a crucial role in the sad story of the, of the Egyed vessels was Károly uh, Jenko. 
apparently after his destructive action, uh, and uh, because the pieces had lost some of their value, Vince Festatich sold the handled dish to Karo Yanku. The goldsmith underlined his ownership by engraving his name into the outer surf surface of the dish. Soon, the highly respected physician in Papa, Janos Roldos, brought the, uh, the dish from the goldsmith after the uh, May 12, uh, 1832, death of Janos Roldos. The dish entered the collection of the Hungarian Nas National Museum as a gift by the Council of West Prime County, the first of the two objects. Based on the recent uh, research, uh, the jug may have remained in the possession of Vince Festatich, who handed it over to the famous Hungarian arts collector of the time, Miklos Jankovic, for study. In 1833, he published a paper on the vessel for the first time, illustrated with engraving by Moses Mitkovic, Mishkovic. How the vessel got to the uh, museum is not yet completely, completely clear, it seems that it did not enter uh, the Hungarian National Museum with the Jankovic collection after 1836, but uh, that the Count himself was the gift giver. Jankovic can allude uh, to this uh, in his article when he emphasized that the jug did not get to the museum the same way as the dish, but through the glorious seal of um, Festetic Vince. The history of the vessels after they were, they were got to the National Museum is also exciting. We sought answers uh, to the following questions. How the condition of the objects changed when uh, they were restored and what methods were used to do document uh, the vessels. For this purpose, we collected all the early engravings, drawings and photos of the objects. The first the two known and uh, preserved series of photographs allow us to draw particularly important conclusions about the state of the vessels in the last uh, decades of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. The first surviving photos were taken by George Kloss sometime in the last quarter of the 19th century, certainly after 1876. The photo uh, shows the state of the jug that was restored by the coppersmith, András Vondrák, because uh, before the 1870s, uh, the steel dented body of the jug was restored by him. The next series of photos was taken for Antal Heckler's article, po uh, probably shortly before its uh, 1909 publication. The glass uh, negatives of the photos were preserved in the archives of the Hungarian National Museum. Based on the differences which can be seen between the two photo series, the vessels were cleaned further and restored again in the time between them. In the photo of George Kloss, the light tone of the foot is uh, striking, which is not a consequence of the poor, poor lighting um, of the object. It is almost certain that uh, this is a whitish plaque, which is a remnant of the acid intervention in 1831. This plug could consist mainly of acid residues, uh, crystallized metal salts and uh, chlorides. After the application of various acids, including aqua regia, the surface of the foot was uh, probably not cleaned even more than 40 years after the destructive intervention. During the acid treatment in 1831, the patina of the vessels could also have been destroyed on large surface. This is clearly shown by the surfaces on uh, which the melted gold and silver spread, there is no trace of the black patina on these parts. In the other places, however, the patina had to regenerate quickly and regrew by itself. Undoubtedly, uh, this process can be proven by the grooves of the Papa Goldsmith's engraved name. At the time of engraving, original reddish color of the copper alloy was certainly visible in these grooves which is now covered with a cohesive black patina. This is one of the most distinctive properties of the Corinthian alloy. 
Also, with the help of the first two photos of the dish, it was managed to discover inlays that currently no uh, longer exist. Among them, the most serious loss is the lotus leaf on the right side of the lotus flower, which uh, had its inlay almost intact before uh, 1909. We also identified the loss that uh, occurred after this time on the bird's wing on the left side of the lotus flower, a section of its wings, gold wire, contour line, and uh, uh, an uh, inlay fell out of the keying. Let's focus uh, on the jug first. Its uh, inlays represent uh, Egyptian uh, gods like Isis, Horus, and Thoth, uh, depicted with gold wire, but the objects in the hand of the gods, as well as uh, the space-filling representations between the gods, uh, were typically highlighted with silver inlays. The god uh, frieze is framed by a silver lines of spirals on the shoulder and uh, a silver olive branch at the bottom. On the shoulder, inlaid in silver, are various crowns and symbols like those of Egyptian uh, gods. An important observation is the earliest photos is that uh, there is a difference of at least 30 degrees in the relative position of the neck and the body of the jug. The position of the neck and the body is also different in the Mishkovich engraving from 1832. The projecting spout of the jug uh, faces the exact opposite direction in this engraving. Furthermore, in another photo taken in 1955, the position of the two vessel parts is different, not only from the uh, current position, but also from the state documented right before 1909. All this points out an important problem. We do not uh, know what uh, the original direction of the spout was. This would be clearly determined based on the position of the handle, but it was lost. It is true that a bronze handle was found together with a jug. The first researchers suggested that this handle may have originally belonged to the jug as a secondary attached uh, handle. We have managed to re-identify this previously lost handle among the artifacts of the Roman collection of the Hungarian National Museum, uh, inventoried without exact provenance. This discovery allows us to state that uh, jug and handle do not fit together and cannot uh, possibly ever uh, have been assembled. So there is no reason to support this hypothesis. The original handle is not lost, but the remains of the solder employed to attach it to the vessel are still visible on one side of the body and on the foot. The artisan who designed and executed the inlaid decoration of the vessel certainly did not calculate with the location of the handle. He left no undecorated surface for it. He looked at the vessel body as a complete piece without any additional part. This means um, that the handle was soldered on the body by someone other than the decorating artisan, whose aesthetic sense uh, was not disturbed uh, that the attache of the handle obscured a small decorated surface. The same general mentality can be detected on the Dionysia cure of the Seuso treasure, that is, uh, uh, where the handle was soldered onto a surface heavily decorated with reliefs. Probably the soldering craftsman uh, did not necessarily consider that according to the design, the handle should be positioned in the same vertical line as the bow connecting the olive branch and the start end point of the running uh, dog motif. Uh, Alessandra uh, Julia Mir was the first who discovered the, uh, and identified the crimson red inlay uh, in uh, the petals of some flowers included in the dish Acanthus frieze. These inlays were made of uh, unalloyed copper. Recently, I managed to find the same crimson red inlay in this case in the decoration of the jug's belly, where the lower lotus buds depicted between the papyrus plants were inlaid with them. This further strengthened uh, the strong connection between the two vessels, which were already demonstrated in uh, uh, 2014. That is, 
Both of the edged vessels were perhaps made at different times, but in the same workshop and by artisans who were using the same recipes and patterns. This conclusion now supported by the three color, in color inlaid effect of the vessels. Both vessels were manufactured of a laver black patinated alloy decorated with inlays made of gold and silvery alloys, as well as unalloyed dark crimson red copper. I have found evidence of an interesting ancient repair on the jug. Uh, part of the kilt of Horus has been uh, cut uh, for repair, forming a keying for a plate decorated later with inlay. This purpose of this repair uh, was to insert the plate to cover a small rectangular patch. This patch was used to correct the casting flow. All this indicates that the intervention was not justified by an accidental injury resulting from the use of the vessel, but it was carried out during the manufacturing process. It is worth mentioning that in the engraving made by Moses Mishkovic in 1831, this plate is still in place and its inlay with parallel gold wires is clearly visible. So uh, this plate probably fell out of its keying and was lost when the coppersmith, András Vondrák, mechanically restored the dents on the vessel body before 1870. In any case, uh, this inserted plate is no longer visible in the photo uh, taken uh, before uh, 1909. Only the empty keying uh, can be seen uh, there. The central medallion of the dish uh, with handle oriented so that the proper view of the composition is seen by the person who washed uh, their hands over the vessel and not by the person who held it. Uh, based on the X-ray uh, image, a complete list of the different plants and animals depicted in the scene could be prepared. Based on their more or less uh, realistic depiction, it was also possible to determine their species. The result of the analysis, both in terms of number and composition of the species, shows a much more diverse picture than previous uh, descriptions mentioned. If we look at the most detailed descriptions of the scene so far, it is obvious how short and incomplete they are. And almost everyone focused only on the central uh, scene, the fight between the hippopotamus and the crocodile, Consequently, I had to draw the conclusion that we uh, practically do not have a detailed and accurate uh, description of the nilotic scene in the medallion. Uh, let's first look at the flora, which is the researchers dealing uh, with the dish only generally mentioned. The scene is dominated by lotuses. At the, the top is an opus, uh, open lotus flower, in addition, six lotus buds, six uh, seed pots, and 10 lotus leaves were depicted on the top uh, of the high uh, stems uh, quite realistically. For instance, the pistils or seeds are visible in the holes of the seed pots, which resemble uh, the rows of a watering can. Besides the lotuses, papyrus plants can also be recognized in two places. Uh, which are topped by a dense cluster of thin uh, thread-like rays. Reeds uh, were also depicted twice. Uh, interestingly, uh, papyrus plants grow from the same stock as lotuses or uh, reeds. These plants uh, really evoke the vegetation of the Nile Delta, placing the animal fight uh, that is the center of the scene in a realistic environment. Uh, next, let's come to the point, uh, to the fauna. In the Nilotic scene, there are not uh, three or four birds, uh, but five, and not at all of them are ducks, as uh, Miguel John uh, Fers Lewis claimed, uh, but uh, they belong to four different bird species. To the right of the animal fight scene, two ducks are sitting on a lotus leaf, and uh, to the left, an alarm Egyptian goose is trying to take off from another lotus leaf. The taxonomic characteristics of both uh, bird species were well depicted by the artisan. The fourth uh, bird uh, clinging to a branch at the top of the scene, to the left of the lotus flower, is particularly important.
In the published early drawings, the bird mostly resembles a goose. However, it has short legs, long fan-like spreading tail feathers, and the crest prominently depicted on the top of its head. This crest, which was not detected before, but it's clearly visible on the X-ray image, consists of five vertical feathers depicted separately from each other. Our only remaining option is to identify this bird with a hoopoe. Uh, this identification is not unproblematic, but an additional argument makes it beyond uh, doubt. The hoopoe's uh, plumage is a cinnamon color with contrasting black and white uh, strips on their wings and tails. These contrasting stripes of uh, different colors are clearly recognizable on the bird's wings and tail feathers. Moreover, its body appears to be highlighted with crimson red uh, patinated inlay, even though the bird uh, has a longer and a thinner neck. It is most likely a hoopoe due to its body shape, high crest, uh, and contrasting uh, striped winged and uh, tail uh, feathers. The fifth uh, uh, bird can be seen at the bottom of the scene below uh, the startled goose. No one has noticed that this bird until now, also, uh, despite its uncertain contours, it is uh, easy, easily recognizable. Uh, the empty keying space uh, clearly outlines the shape of the bird, uh, giving uh, it a, a silhouette. Based on this, the bird was a long-legged uh, vader bird with a long S-shaped neck. Due to its body shaped proportions and movement, the bird is clearly identified, uh, identifiable as an ibis. On the right side of an animal fight scene, directly uh, behind the hippopotamus tail, a lotus leaf is uh, swinging, on which a half-destroyed figure depicted with gold wire inlaid can be seen. In the drawings of the scene, it was indicated uh, with a few lines, but uh, they could not interpret it. Also, the X-ray image show, uh, shows most clearly that this uh, figure is a sitting four-legged animal. This animal holds its head high, and its back is decorated with the circles. Based on these, the animal shown in a profile looking to the right is a frog resting on a lotus leaf. The god uh, frieze of the Egyed Ewer also represents frogs sitting on a lotus. But their body is much uh, stockier and almost spheri spherical, and their uh, backs are not decorated with circles, but with square mesh inlays. This uh, fundamental difference between the two frog depictions uh, is the best way uh, to prove that the two vessels were decorated by two different artisans. One more animal, identified for the first time, uh, completes the fauna of the Nilotic scene. A fish can also be identified on the left side of the lotus, in the center of the bottom of the scene. The shape of the empty keying space, which uh, no longer contains inlays, uh, visually outlines uh, the streamlined body, dorsal, pelvic, and uh, equal lobe tail fins of a fish. However, it is not yet possible to determine the species of the fish. The artisan who designed the compos composition uh, depicts the word under and above water at the same time without clearly separating them from each other. Also, it is possible to demonstrate the artisan's uh, intention for a true-to-life uh, uh, representation. He uh, still used depictions and details that differ from reality or are alien uh, to it. For example, the longer neck of the hoopoe and uh, the airy swinging of two adult ducks on a lotus leaf or uh, the neg neglect of uh, relative size of the animals. Based on this, I agree with Rudolf Pagenstecher's opinion, formulated in 1809. The decoration of the pan exhibits various borrowed ornamental motifs, which are employed in the wrong places and produce a meaningless effect. The feeling that each decorative member has its own purpose, the sense for the architecture of ornament was unknown to the silversmith who composed this medley. 
No, I make a few brief uh, comments on the uh, crocodile att attacking by a hippopotamus scene, which was an adopted popular motif uh, in nilotic scenes of the Roman period, like on the base of the marble statues uh, resting uh, personified Nile in the Louvre and the Vatican Museum. According to some Hungarian researchers, including Vilmos, Vilmos Veszecki, this fight, although its depiction can be traced back to the images dated to the pharaonic times, is uh, unimaginable. Therefore, it was uh, classified as an unrealistic element of the scene. It is true that the two uh, species usually coexist peacefully and respect uh, one another, uh, but uh, some nature of films and nature of photos clearly show that sometimes violent conflicts occur between them. The X-ray uh, image confirms confirms the details that cannot be seen with uh, the naked eye today. For example, the crocodile's uh, nose and the teeth, as well as its ears, uh, are clearly visible. The contours of the hexagonal scales of the back skin were emphasized with gold wire inlaid, and the oval-shaped inlays were placed in the middle of the scales. These scales were arranged in a regular pattern. The hippo steps on the crocodile's tail with its left, uh, left front leg. Based on its uh, uh, raised head position, the hippopotamus uh, either lifted the body of the crocodile off the ground or lifted it out of the water. I would like to present uh, to you uh, here a new carnelian uh, gem uh, with a nilotic scene published in uh, 2005, which was found in Carnuntum, uh, today Austria and Upper Pannonia, not far from the site of the Egyed vessels. In this scene too, the uh, hippopotamus uh, raises uh, the crocodile, which is in its mouth. But uh, on this gem, the head of the crocodile, contrary to the scene depicted on the Egyet dish and on the relief from the Albany collection in the Louvre, is not facing upwards, uh, but downwards. The Nilotic scenes from the Pannonian provinces, including a stone relief found in Székesfehérvár, indicate that there were sophisticated and educated customers of objects decorated with Nilotic uh, uh, theme who understood the visual messages of the uh, scenes. The place where the edged vessels were manufactured is uh, difficult to establish because we only have indirect arguments for the attribution. As I mentioned earlier, we can say with certainty that the two vessels of the find were made in the same important center of metallurgy, albeit is uh, slightly different times and by the hand of different but similarly skilled artisans. The question can be simplified to the following. Uh, were the vessels made in Alexandria or Italy, and if the later place, then in Campania or in Rome? In uh, 2014, we concluded that it is, a hardly, it is hardly possible to look for a workshop in another place than in Egypt and the, in the city of Alexandria, where, uh, according to the sources and finds, skilled artis artisans and workshops followed old traditions and manufactured highly valued metal vessels, and among them also luxurious Corinthian alloy wares. The inscriptions and the studies published in recent years have drawn attention to the importance of the Corinthiarii uh, working in Rome. Based on these epigraphical sources, it can be stated that uh, Rome was one of the main centers to produce luxury objects made of Corinthian alloy in the early imperial period. The possibility of production in Rome was also raised in connection with the Mensa, which is important from the point of view of the Egyed vessels as well, because, as we concluded in 2014, the parallels in uh, composition and style certainly seem to indicate that the vessels from Egyed and the amazing altar top were made perhaps by different artisans or at slightly different times, but in uh, one and the same workshop and by artists who were uh, using the same figure templates. This was an important conclusion uh, because uh, if the place of manufacture of either of the two finds can be determined, we can also locate the workshop of the other find. Uh, 
However, the fact that the Mensa had been probably found in Rome does not mean that it could not have been produced in an Egyptian workshop or by uh, Egyptian specialized hand workers in Rome. Finally, some words on the direction for further study. Here I mention a current research program investigating the silver vessels of the late Roman Seuss of treasure. In this project, we had the opportunity to use the modern methods of 3D technology and archaeometry, uh, which included several destructive and non-destructive analyses. Uh, taking the results of this project into account, we are planning a new research program, which this time will focus on the edged vessels. We also plan the digital reconstruction of the original appearance of the vessels for the new permanent exhi uh, archaeological exhibition of the Hungarian National uh, Museum. Many thanks for your kind attention. Thank you very much for your introduction. I want first to thank the, the organizer of this conference and uh, for having invited me. Um, the recent study on the Mensa Isiaca by specialists from the Getty and the Museo Egizio has given the scientific community a better understanding of a work of art that illustrates the ancient mastery of metallic inlays and patinas but the difficulty we all face lies in the absence of a precise archaeological context. In the field of bronze, even, if, uh, even with improvements over the centuries, there has been a form of technological continuity since the perfecting in the second half of the 6th century BCE of the indirect method in the lost wax hollow casting process and of joining techniques. In terms of colors and polychromy, the same principles based on the use of metallic inlays and of protective surface treatments were applied from the classical to the Roman imperial period with the addition of patinas that illustrate an evolution in taste from the second century BCE onward. According to literary sources and figurative representations, Men's complexions were dark and women's light in the Greek world as elsewhere. This was the chromatic norm expressed in the Odyssey by the action of Athena. Odysseus had a black skin as a valiant warrior. Penelope was whiter than sown ivory. The same contrast between dark and light was still the case in the second half of the 6th century BCE, as shown on the wooden tablets from Pizza in the middle, with the orange skin male figures are clearly differentiated from the female ones, whose outlines are drawn directly in the red ochre on the white surface. However, the distinction was not necessarily obvious at the same time in ivory, clay or bronze, as the materials intrinsically dictated the color of the skin tones. In the case of ivories, we should mention the pale complexion of the sculpted dancer on the left, which adorn a lie. The clay vase figurine from a century later depicts a kneeling youth, which seems with its eyebrows and eye rims treated with black glaze, the mouth still slightly red, and the general tone relati relatively light to transpose a bronze figure directly into clay. Because of the natural corrosion of bronzes, it is necessary to draw on iconographic evidence and on literary and epigraphic sources in order to understand what bronze workers were looking for when they transposed skin color onto metal. The silver vase is unearthed in Thrace and decorated with, with leaf-gilded motifs, illustrate the excellence of Athenian theoretic production during the 5th century BCE and give an answer. They confirm that their makers were attentive to the creation of large-scale bronze statuary. On the body of a cantharos, Dated to 440-435 BCE, Theseus is reminiscent of several Polycletus creations, including Kiniscus and the Doryphoros, for its general attitude and poise. 
The use of gold to represent the figure inspired by the canon and the caustic arrangement of weight-bearing and relaxed limbs allows us to appreciate with a high degree of certainty what the appearance of a newly created bronze statue might have been in the middle of the 5th century BCE. By multiplying short strokes to suggest the nascent beard on the cheek and furrows, fairly wide and close together to draw the locks of hair, the turret used precious metal to evoke not only the effect of light on the metal sculptures of his time, but also their general basic color. Among the very few confirmed representations of bronze sculptures on Greek vases in the, is the figure of Talos seized by the Dioscuri. The Dioscuri are treated using the red figure technique while the robot's body is entirely highlighted in white. Its metallic character is accentuated by a yellow-brown varnish that blends with the white, drawing the muscular masses. The flat areas of yellow-white underlined with brown give the illusion of volumes and of the bronze's changing shine according to the light it receives. A bronze statue appears also on the fragment of a crater from Taranto on the right. Apollo, identified by name, is shown seated with dark hair outside the temple housing his bronze effigy. Here too, the painter has emphasized the opposition between the god who behaves like a living being and the metallic cult statue. These two iconographic testimonies confirm that at the end of the fifth and beginning of the fourth century BCE, bronze sculptures retain the base color for both, both skin and hair that was close to the color they had when they left the workshop. Once the cast skin had been scrapped off and the surface is polished, the color was close to that of a yellow or pinkish gold, depending on the level of tin mixed with the copper. And as a matter of fact, the earlier reconstruction, close to the iconographic and archaeological evidence proposed by Peter Gerke in 1991, has to be kept in mind. He had a plaster cast of the castle Apollo completely covered in metal foil in order to restore the color and brilliance of the original, possibly the Phidias Apollo Panopios or the Calamis Apollo Alexikakos. And on the right you have the Derveni Crater, produced probably in Athens in 370 BCE, which was not gilded, but presents the hue of a copper alloy containing 15% of tin. The bronze surfaces had to be tightened, that is, the cast skin had to be eliminated. As the bronze solidifies on contact with the casting mold, it develops a lumpy, rough and porous texture that was unsuitable. From the first stage of scraping the cast skin to the final polishing of the surfaces, in order to enhance the bronze's shine, the craftsmen used a variety of abrasive materials and tools, emery ground to a powder and mixed with oil, stones of different hardnesses, initially coarse and then finer and finer up to the pumice stone, then metal scrapers. On the foundry cup, side B, two craftsmen are busy with the final polishing of a large statue in arms. They are holding scrapers and leaning against the work. This is the ultimate moment of nuanced control over the shine of a bronze statue about to leave the workshop. The bronze workers assessed whether the surface was smooth or slightly textured after the tool had passed over it. The ancient sought out the changing shine of metal, which varied according to the nature of the light and the way it reflected off polished inside or plastically treated surfaces. The effect of light observed as linked to the treatment of metal surfaces were known empirically to ancient sculptors. As underlined by Edilberto Formelli in 2013, sculptors knew, for instance, that bronze retains a matte, not a shiny surface, quite far in the process of polishing, until after the action of pumice stone. This optical phenomenon can be explained by the fact that the numerous tiny scratches in the epidermis 
are neither oriented nor large enough to create diffraction effects. And he added, this is why bronze workers completed the polishing process, as shown on the, in the foundry cup, by using a metal scraper. This tool, which removed fine flakes, produced notches of varying depth, depending on how it was guided. The scraper also vibrated to create small depression perpendicular to the notches. These undulations were so dense that they generated significant diffraction effects that accentuated the three-dimensionality of the work in places chosen by the craftsman. He said that it is also likely that the hair, beard, mustache, and pubic hair of a bronze sculpture appeared darker from the origin, and they were no, not abrased during the cold working process, but only chiseled out. Adilberto Formilli's pioneering work on the Riace warriors, published in the early 1980s, had revealed the complexity of the processes involved, particularly for the polychromy of the faces, which concentrated most of the metallic uh, inlays. He was able to complete his study during the third phase of restoration of the two statues, 2009-2011, and could provide a fundamental update on the treatment of the surface, on the distinction that needs to be made between natural and artificial patinas, and on the action of light when it strikes the metal. As shown by the Delphi charioteer, Bronze sculptors used mostly metal working techniques such as inlaying and plating to add polychrome effects to their works. Unalloyed and alloyed metals were added to the general hue of the copper-based alloy. It was a search for mimesis. Unalloyed copper was used for, for instance, for the eyebrows, eyelashes, and lips. The, the teeth were made of silver, the eyes made of different stones that were identified by uh, the team that was uh, working on the charioteer over uh, five years of mission. The eyes of the portrait of Suthis III around 300 BC were made of powder glass mixed with different chemical elements, an evolution no doubt to restore the apparent humidity of the human I. The analytical study of the decoration of the headband of the charioteer confirmed the presence of tin in the meander and crosses. This was totally unexpected and is unique. It has yet to be explained. We were puzzled by the two fillets framing the meander on the headband. Was there an intentional patina since these fillets appear to be black? The answer was negative. Copper contains no gold, silver, or sulfur, which would have made it possible to consider the presence of ancient patina. Here is a view of freshly polished metals. The bronze, bronze's metallic palette was then subtle and pastel-like, and if we compare the color of an unalloyed copper used for the lips, for instance, on the left side, to that of a binary copper alloy with 10% tin, there is little contrast between the two. Despite the lengthy process which took place after the casting, it was impossible to preserve the sheen and color of the metal without repeating the mechanical abrasion carried out in the workshop or without chemically treating the surface as a preventive measure. Dio Chrysostom, in his Melancomas, speaks of a boxer, Iatrocles, whose skin was of the color of a bronze of a good alloy. Probably was it because he trained outdoors, his skin echoing the aspect of a tarnished bronze alloy, an evolution that could happen very fast after the manufacturing of a statue. Copper alloy is unstable, it begins to darken just after a few years, and it corrodes quickly. Several written, uh, sorry, seven written sources confirm that bronze works had to be anointed periodically to protect them from natural corrosion and specify which substances to use. In order to slow down and delay alteration, 
that is the natural corrosion of a copper alloy, which contact with the air and variations in humidity made inevitable, the ancients coated bronze with a translucent protective layer obtained by diluting bituminous substances or fine resins in olive oil. First of all, this translucent layer applied to the metal epidermis after polishing made it glow and shine. It enhanced the overall color, giving it depth and brilliance without changing it. The epigraphic sources from the Greek world, and particularly those from Delos during the last uh, centuries of the Hellenistic period, mention the annual inspection of the condition of the objects by the administrators and priests in charge of the cult, and the therapia, that is, the care given to the offerings. Their cosmesis involved cleaning, surface treatments, regilding, and any necessary repairs. To please the deity, the agalma had to be made shiny and bright again. The term, the term ganosis, making shiny, appears alongside with cosmesis in the accounts. This was a surface treatment. Okay. Sorry. But as demonstrated by Edilberto Formilli, 2013, the few zones of black color spotted like a glaze on the left foot of warrior A do not correspond to a natural patina that would have formed in the oxygen-deprived marine environment, nor exactly to an artificial patina intended to change the color of the bronze, but rather to faint traces of ancient treatments that have darkened the bronze. The shiny black patina can now be interpreted as the result of successive protective treatments with substances containing sulfur. This is the first time that the composition of such a glaze in fine layers has been identified. By examining the, the metallographic section of a detached fragment and analyzing it, Formerly was able to verify that this patina was based on copper sulfide, and he added, I quote, bitumen derived from petroleum contains up to 8% sulfur and can therefore form a black patina on bronzes. The slight acidity of the olive oil residue react, reacts chemically with the copper component of the bronze to form calcocyte. This creates a kind of transparent lacquer, which becomes darker and darker, but still allows the metallic color of the bronze to shine through. The head of Suthi III was probably left in the open air for a very short time before being buried, a few meters from the facade of the cenotaph of the Odrysian ruler. Therefore, this thin translucent translucent and protective layer changed very little before burial. It does not conceal at the base of the neck on the right the underlying traces left on the bronze by its original polishing. Observing the black zones on the Salamis youth, Wolf Dieter Heilmeier had proposed that they were intended to echo the evolution of the translucent protection applied to earlier bronzes epidermis. And it is true that the works of sculptors from the classical period, 5th and 4th century BCE, were certainly already in an intermediate state by the Hellenistic period. And this state would have led to a change in taste dictated to the newly aesthetic that the inevitable darkening of metal surfaces imposed. This phenomenon may explain the appearance of intentionally dark artificial patinas before the end of the Hellenistic period. A terracotta dated to the first half of the first century BCE may reflect this development on, in ancient bronzes. It is entirely covered in brown paint with the exception of the eyes. It is not gilded like most of the terracotta figurine produced by Smyrna's craftsmen at the same time. Was it blackened to imitate the appearance of bronzes darkened by centuries of exposure, or was it deliberately patinated? On the right, a fresco in Pompeii, dated between 50 and 79, shows a very dark figure 
smaller than life-size, resting on a circular plinth, it is indeed a statue, its metallic skin reflecting the light. The first documented intentional black patina in the Greek world was identified on several bronzes found in the Madea shipwreck. These bronzes predate the end of the second century BCE according to the date of the shipwreck. A sulfur-based black coating was found on a small number of statuettes and decorative elements. The left iris of one of the large dancing dwarf figures is a nail comprising 67% copper and 32% sulfur, which was patinated before being inserted into the eyeball. The darkening of the copper alloy due to the sulfur was known to the ancients. Philostratus the Elder reported that bronze effigies found near hot springs blackened due to the fumes. The black color made possible by the new mastery of artificial patinas allowed for very strong contrasts. A number of medium-sized bronzes entirely patinated illustrate the new appeal for contrast of two colors, black and white on the left, or three colors, black, white, and red, the ribbons on the right. There were different recipes yet to be understood and reproduced. Such a rare glossy black patina with a sheen close to that of enamel was studied at the c 2 rmf on the surface on, of a balustrade element, a pillar with a sotized head whose silver eyes, lips, and vertical staff in red copper stand out against the dark background. Lead bronze, approximate 10% tin and 10% lead, is covered, body and face, with this black patina which has been proven to be obtained by heating to around 600 degrees Celsius. The lead played certainly a role that has yet to be understood more precisely. Another of these black patinas, which is even more fascinating, was used to obtain the Corinthian bronze of ancient texts. It was very well studied by Alessandra Jumla Maya since the beginning of the 1990s, 1990s and is present on the Mensa Isiaka. After Joe Chrysostom's mention, this particular alloy was used as a comparison to evoke the color of a human being's skin the complexion of the young Mauritanian Marcus Aurelius Cesar, who died in Patras, is compared to Corinthian bronze on his funerary steel. This fabulous alloy, said to have been discovered through the fortuitous melting of bronze, gold, and silver during the sack of Corinth in 146 BC, hence its name, was sought after the wealthiest Romans and described by the alchemist Zosimus of among others, by the alchemist Sodimos of Panopolis, active around 300 CE. This alloy, which did not corrode, as observed by Cicero, developed a black-purple or black-blue iridescent dance and deep durable patina, precisely because of the presence of small quantity of gold and or silver and trace elements such as arsenic and iron. Hypothesis on the formation mechanism and and optical properties of the black layer were published by Marco Couturier, François Matisse, and Dominique Robsis in 2017. They, had to, they have to deal with nanoparticles. We don't know of any Hellenistic Corinthian bronze, although they might have appeared after the middle of the second century BCE, we rely, if we rely on ancient let literature. The technique was learned most probably through Egypt, which never lost the knowledge since Egyptian models can be traced from the beginning of the second millennium to the first half of the first millennium BCE. Greek, Greek craftsmen could have discovered it under Ptolemaic pharaohs. The earliest known examples of Corinthian bronzes, that is black bronzes or black coppers, if the alloy does not contain tin, date from the first century CE. The examples identified are either inlays or exceptionally very small statuettes and uh, items like the egg jug, uh, such as the two figurines of a young African in the pose of a narrator. We don't know of any large or even medium-sized statues, as black bronze seem difficult to cast, but this has to be discussed with an uneven result when it is uh, three-dimensional. 
These two statuettes cast in hollow, which in itself denotes a real mastery of the casting process, are composed of several parts cast separately in different alloys, including Corinthian bronze for the complexions. Legs are missing on both. Here you have the, the statuette from Aux, and you see the small size of the statuette, 6.8 centimeter. Uh, the statuette was cast into five or six parts, which were assembled by soldering. The hematian is a ternary copper alloy with tin and lead, thus a bronze. The head is a black copper with an intentional addition of gold and small amount of silver and arsenic. The, the second statuette is uh, uh, kept in uh, Saint-Germain-en-Laye and comes from Avignon, southern France. It was studied at the c 2 rmf a close observation and X-radiograph shows that apart from legs, the statuette was cast into two separate pieces, the bust and the hematian, once again intentionally in order to assemble different copper alloys. These two parts were joined with lead. The mantle is a hollow cast with very regular walls, demonstrating the high mastery of the casting. Thanks to the, part, the particle accelerator Aglae, Non-destructive analyses were performed by Pixie. They confirmed that the hematian is a ternary copper alloy, whereas the bust approximate is a black bronze with addition of gold and silver. Uh, the the C2RMF uh, studied the ink pot from Vaison La Romaine as well, where you can see inlays in made of gold, silver, copper, and black copper. And uh, the body is a brass and the lid is a bronze. So here are details. You see the black copper of the inlay uh, for Venus mantle or the black copper for Erotus wings. Another statuette we... Um, okay. We uh, studied very uh, recently, because it was purchased in 2018, represents Bacchus. And uh, he originally leaned left on his thirst surround and um, hold, he held a bunch of grapes in his right hand. This statuette is far superior in artistic quality to all other preserved examples of this type. The god wears a panther skin, which is rare in representations of Bacchus. The feline's head is visible on his left shoulder. His boots are also cut from panther skin. It's a work of great mastery with no flaws. According to analysis carried out at the Centre de Recherche et de Restauration des Musées de France, the statuette's basic alloy is a nine-person tin bronze. The lip and the right nipple are inlaid with red copper, the eyes and boots buttons with silver. And here you can see uh, the macro X-ray fluorescence scanning. Each window corresponds to a chemical element. The lighter the color, the higher the contact of the elements. So here you have a restitution of the real colors uh, with, which combine the results of uh, the MAXRF scanning and local analysis by the particle accelerator Aglae. Uh, the RBS uh, analysis did not yield any usable results. Uh, there are two main reasons for this, corresponding to two types of pollution of different origin. First of all, the soil concretion and a selenium juice put on the surface of the statuette before the acquisition, modifying the general hue and covering also the red copper and black copper inlays. And I want to finish to show you this street gel, uh, which was found in Tunisia. It comes from the Le Kef, from a tomb in a modest necropolis of a Roman colony of Sicia, Venaria. The deceased Lucius Julius Martialis was accompanied with a second street gel without any decor. This one has been heavily cleaned on the main side to make the punctured mot motif of a boxer and a manufacturer's stamp ANT for anthos may be more visible, removing the patina from most of the figure and the grid patterns above and under it. 
Luckily, the reverse with ivy leaves has been preserved and keeps a smooth orange patina. The stridge is made of brass with just under 20% zinc by mass. Its composition is very similar to that of the orange inlays of the Mensa Isiaka. The entire surface has been patinated and the patina was scrapped off by a mechanical process in the undecorated areas. It's only the surface roughness which distinguishes the patinated from the non-patinated areas. To conclude, most Greek and Roman items play on the brightness and of the contrast with a relatively simple polychromy based on the presence of a few metallic inlays, far from, I quote, the more than a thousand individual inlaid pieces in the Mensa. It is not the same tradition. The many multicolored inlays stem from Egyptian, neither Greeks or nor Roman tradition. That doesn't mean that the craftsmen were not Roman, but then. The Mensa shows skills that date back to the texts of the Alexandrian alchemists. The artist who created this masterpiece surrounded himself with the best specialists, maybe from the casting to the elaboration and perfect fitting of the patinated pieces that make up his decor, its decor. We are undoubtedly looking with the Mensa at a work of the highest patron commission, and what would it be if we retain the modern history of the Mensa and the first mention of his appearance, which is Rome. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for these wonderful examples. Um, we will continue with lectures two more lectures and then have again time for discussion before our lunch break. So it's my pleasure to welcome Agnes Benzonelli from the University of Cambridge, who will take us deeper into the subject of patination in the Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me here and uh, to all the speakers for the interesting talks and for giving me even more questions and things to talk about. Uh, my name is Agnese Benzanelli, and today I will present you my research on patination. Uh, it's, of course, a huge and complex topic and uh, with many interesting points to be covered. Um, so I couldn't go in detail in this presentation, but I'm very happy to discuss any of uh, the details with you later or here you have my email. So in the study of uh, ancient patination, I believe it's important to understand the theoretical framework um, behind the approaches used so far in um, the study of uh, patinas and the legacy that these approaches still bring. For this, we have to consider the scholarly um, interest in this material and therefore start our story from far away from uh, the Mediterranean in, in Japan. So in 1854, after the fall of the samurai, Japan opened its border to the Western world. So all Europe was wet by a new wave of Orientalism, including, of course, the fashionability of collecting Japanese art. The tsuba, the handguard of the Japanese sword, became one of the most sought after item by collectors, thanks to the uh, distinctive design and, and colors. So in contrast to the Chinese or European sword, the Japanese um, tsuba is a separate metal plate. So it could have been, uh, it was decorated by specialized craftsmen. Um, the alloys, Okay, here the handguard. The alloys used uh, to, um, to make the tsuba are called irogane, which means colored alloys. And these were copper alloy with small amount of different precious metal into the copper and then patinated to obtain different colors that then were 
used to create beautiful patterns and, and design. Uh, the main alloy was called uh, Chacoudeau, and it's a uh, black copper, so copper with gold patinated to black. And a similar alloy was um, made later in China from uh, Japan. In 1887, Midtone linked the Eastern Japanese Shakudo to Mediterranean bronze artifacts that appear black, black based on the appearance of the patina. So from the 1990, archaeometry was applied to investigate these Western black alloys, and a few of them indeed contain gold and were therefore recognized among museum collections. So since then, the interest in this class of material grew with the first philological research and theories of possible connections between the main cultures in which uh, black material was found. From 97, the term black bronze was first used, and in recent year, we have also thermal patination more and more recognized in artifacts. So we have thermal patination, uh, so technique um, using heat, um, to create a patina using heat, and it's easily recognizable on artifacts for the presence of tannerite. And we find this kind of patination in e Egyptian, early Iron Age, and Roman artifacts. Then we have black bronze alloys, that is defined as a class of alloys that was generated by adding a small amount of precious metal to the copper and then treated with different chemical solution in order to develop a fine and compact resistant patina made, a, made of um, a network of cuprite in which fine gold particles were dispersed. And these particles gives the film the particular blue with purple shades. So, if we consider black bronze as a class of materials, the material has been found in different archaeological contexts, um, uh, from ancient Egypt to modern Japan. The date of Shakudo is uh, wrong. Um, therefore, it is a cross-cultural phenomenon. However, it's not clear if black bronze technology in different uh, cultures was the result of a single approach, or it was made in a range of ways reflecting independent invention. Obviously, there are different uh, cultural connotation and use, aesthetic use of, the, of them. I will now go uh, really quickly through a review of the, uh, our current knowledge on black bronze alloys in different cultures, presenting the work done in, mainly in the 90s on text and objects, but also suggesting that the assignation of very specific composition uh, of the alloy and process to a material cited in ancient text is sometimes a bit of a stretch. So from 19th century BC in Egypt, we have uh, the first object, this crocodile. We have many other black bronzes presented in this um, symposium and also traces, uh, also artifacts with um, traces of thermal patination. The first text is uh, much later and is empty chem, translated as black copper, and is uh, in a list of highly valued materials. However, there is no indication of the composition or uh, if or any treatment was done on this uh, material. We just know there is black copper. Um, in the literature, we also have suggestions that could refer to unrefined copper or meteoritic iron. But for this, I need the help of uh, my colleagues, uh, Egyptologists. Uh, in my scene, we have the famous beautiful daggers. And um, it's really interesting, and we have to remember this for later, that the black copper, um, we, we find daggers with copper and gold, and copper, gold, and silver. So this is uh, interesting for later on. We then have a suggestion that the terms kianos or quano uh, could refer to a black um, alloy made with copper and gold and patinated to black. However, for two reasons. Uh, um, one is because it could uh, derive from a word um, meaning mixed metals. 
or allude to the reflection of blue and iridescent patina of black bronze. However, um, so speaking with historian, is uh, commonly considered a generic term for blue or blue materials, blue animals, blue mineral. But there is no, again, um, composition uh, cited or any reference to a metal or a treatment to patinate. We have the famous Corinthian bronze in the Mediterranean. We have Pliny in the first century CE who described three different varieties of Corinthian bronze. One uh, that is silvery, where silver predominates, another that is gold, golden where gold predominates, and one with a, a mixture of the two that is liverish, so reddish, approaching the appearance of, of liver. However, again, this is highly debated of what Pliny was actually describing. Firstly, Pliny is not really famous to describe uh, correct things. Sometimes he describes things that he doesn't really know uh, or he sees. Um, and other people say that he's describing the color, not the composition, so golden, and then he assumed it was gold uh, or silvery, so assume it was silver. Or uh, this is a description of uh, depletion gilding. So more question here. Uh, Pausania is the only author who described the process to make Corinthian bronze. And he said that the metal uh, was heat until red hot and then plunged in the water of the fountain Pyrene. And then we have Zosimos. We actually have a 15th century copy of a 10th century translation to Syriac of a 3rd century Greek um, original text. Uh, with many recipes, one of which is how to make black Corinthian bronze. So this is the first, so the, this 15th century text is the first um, example of uh, and correlation of the word Corinthian bronze with the alloy and with the color black. We have then objects in the Roman world as we see uh, in this symposium, and also example of thermal patinated uh, objects. Um, we have just five or six objects in the Anglo-Saxon world, but their um, actual intentionality, the intentionality of their production is questioned by the same archeology span who find them and analyze them. So to summarize, this class of alloys contain Shakudo and Butong, who we know well established traditions, uh, patinate objects, artifacts containing gold and silver, and a dark patina recognized in, mu in museum collection, and dark or treated material, or blue in the case of Quanor Kianos. Uh, none of them, except of the Zosimos recipes, we have a specific um, um, composition or mention of a treatment. So I believe there are three major issues uh, in the study of the class of patinated bronzes or black bronzes, uh, excluding the thermal patination so far. The first is intrinsic with the material. So it's very difficult to analyze patina, to recognize the patina. Uh, because even if the artificial patina should be passivating centuries in, in the ground is not uh, ideal for them. Um, we also have um, restoration processes. The second issue is the way liter literary and, some, and to some extent archaeometric methods are used. So aside from the use of methods or analytical techniques, not appropriate for the analysis of thin patinas, but more uh, bulk. We have a very few experiments, some of them non-accurate, to replicate the material under study. For example, the reproduction of uh, Shakudo using tin in the alloy that is never present. Moreover, the current knowledge on black bronze production technology as I just uh, said, is based on conclusion derived from translation on, of ancient texts that are intrinsically vague and imprecise. Uh, for example, um, Pausania and, well, actually all the classical authors say that uh, the Corinthian bronze was so famous that didn't require an explanation. So this makes our life much more uh, difficult. Um, so 
this translation, um, uh, this um, conclusion derived from uh, the translation of ancient text are often um, not helped by assessing the actual uh, feasibility of the procedure or the potential for a successful outcome. So this leads to make an assumption that um, uh, precious metal was intentionally added, the intentional, uh, the, the pattern was intentionally created, and also the, the technology is just one, uh, similar to the shakudo, but we, we saw in a few presentations yesterday that we can also use other metals, for example, a paste or other uh, chemicals. So the final issue that I see here is the theoretical approach behind the research that I mentioned in my first slide. So ever since black bronze were imported from Japan and valued as art objects, um, so they were valued for their aesthetic, whether as a material or as a compo component of the final artifacts. So this art historical approach um, usually concentrate, concentrate on the use an impact of the objects and its reception, rather than on the making in use. What is missing here is the study of black bronze and therefore a proper understanding of different periods and social context and the consequence different technology they are, that are used in different archaeological contexts. So this lack of context leads to a general tendency to consider black bronze as a unitary group of artifacts. So, um, I, uh, this is what inspired me to dig a bit deeper in the study of this class of material using methods that are both archaeological sound and solidly scientific. First of all, I designed a combined experimental and archaeological approach um, project uh, aimed to solve three main questions. Firstly, it's necessary to clearly understand the material and the technology used uh, to patinate the alloys from a modern material science perspective, characterizing different patinas. Then the fact that so many cultures chose to make and use black uh, deserves attention. So it is important to explore which factor may have led to the appreciation for this material, as well as the techno uh, techno technical knowledge of the makers. Finally, the key archaeological question is whether black bronze making technology was invented once or multiple times. In order to begin to address this major question, um, it is useful to characterize the ways in which black bronze was made in different cultures as a starting point to uh, facilitate a comparison. So I use a review of literature and uh, data published, uh, experiments and new analysis. So um, this figure shows the frequency distribution histogram of the gold content and really quickly what um, it, uh, one of the things uh, it shows is that in Chinese and Japanese we never have gold above 7% while in uh, Egypt and Greek and uh, well also in Roman uh, world but um, this part is not completed. Um, we have a much uh, a wider um, variability of the gold content in uh, the black bronzes, up to 25% in uh, the Egyptian artifacts. And to obtain a black gold, 3 to 5% is enough. Um, the um, similar results can be gathered from the principal component analysis that uh, show the uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, cluster really well uh, together, and uh, all the west, all the yeah, all the Western artifacts uh, differ because they contain tin. So this is the main difference between uh, the East and the West objects, except those uh, two of the daggers from Mycenae, that some of them contain tin, other don't. Also, uh, we have. Um, a lot of minor elements in the uh, Western artifacts, uh, and this is a claim that someone used to uh, support the non-intentionality of the gold addition, but instead um, 
recycling of a gilded material and therefore the gold uh, finish inside um, the materials, for example, for the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, I reproduce four different technologies, uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese, the Pausania recipes for Corinthian bronze, and artificial aging to simulate natural corrosion on eight different alloys, with or without gold, with or without tin and silver, and analyze them with six analytical techniques, boring cross-section, uh, invasive and non-invasive techniques, um, and compare the, uh, the experimental patinas with the artifacts analysis from five different cultures. So uh, even if I won't focus on uh, ja Japan now, um, of course the uh, results on the Japanese uh, reproduction and comparison with the artifacts was the most interesting because we know which alloy they selected. So it was very useful to compare with the patinas growth on alloys that they didn't select to see the effect of, um, for example, the alloy composition. So this is a few things that we looked at, uh, why the craftsmen uh, may have selected a specific um, alloy composition, surface preparation, solution composition, patination, duration, and cleaning. So we look at this on the patinas. Uh, the first colorimetric analysis on uh, artifacts also confirmed the role of gold in making the patina uh, bluer and darker. The analysis of uh, three um, Egyptian statuettes show that one that was um, classified as black bronze did not contain um, uh, gold, uh, the one at the right hand side. Uh, the other contain up to 11 um, percentage of gold and the color uh, of the patina, uh, the black bronze patina, is uh, really different from uh, the uh, Japanese one. It's um, black uh, without really a blue uh, iridescence patina. And the main uh, difference, um, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't show in picture as much as when you see the artifacts, but uh, the, um, the alloy that um, Ford passed around yesterday. So the patina in uh, Japanese alloys, it's really kind of inside. It's not a layer over the uh, original alloy. Uh, it's, it's like the, the metal itself, it's, uh, it's colored when you, when you look at them. In here, in this small picture, you can see that it's uh, really rough, it's not as smooth. And even considering the post-depositional um, effect, that we might have uh, had on this patina, the patina is really different. This doesn't mean that it's not intentional, it's just probably a different uh, process. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon patinas um, results uh, were also um, really interesting even uh, if it's not uh, the subject of the talk because it's not Mediterranean, but uh, in the analysis of a bracelet from Justin Bailey, she analyzed the, the, the patina and she saw that the gold is depleted in the patina, while in Chinese and Japanese artifacts, the gold is enriched in the patina. And the patina is actually a tin rich layer. So the, the authors proposed that the gold is from recycling and natural patination made them black. And the experiment on the simulation of uh, natural patination showed that we can achieve black on tin bronzes or on copper gold alloy, even without an artificial treatment. They just become black. Here, another example. This was a brooch um, that was um, recorded uh, as a black bronze alloy but the composition is just different uh, from the metal plate and it has more tin, more lead and iron. So it's possible that this kind of black patina that is smooth and nice and looks really like artificial is uh, similar to the Chinese bronzes, so a tin rich layer on the surface. 
I now focus on the Mediterranean and on the Korean tembrons, and I uh, believe that this case study represents the complexity of text interpretation and recipes re uh, reproduction. So um, I also would like to highlight the necessity of collaborating with historians who can not only translate from one uh, language to the other, but actually they understand what they are talking about. And also to collaborate with, um, with craftsmen who can re reproduce properly the, uh, the alloys, because it's not as easy as it seems or as I believed at the beginning of my research. So I use literature, experiment, and new analysis. So for the Korean Sembrons, oh, uh, we have uh, four hypotheses to date. So the patinated, we have uh, um, a suggestion that is just a tin bronze produced in Corinth, or a copper gold silver alloy artificially gilded, or a forgery of a precious metal. And the color was modified by uh, adding or removing tin, so making it whiter or yellower. I uh, collected around 50 texts from Greek and um, uh, Latin authors. And um, of course, some of them talk about the, um, the, the burning of alloys, uh, so gold, uh, copper, and silver, to, and, uh, the, and the Corinthian bronze was created by accident in this fire but also other um, texts that shouldn't be ignored talk about something else. For example, Cicero said, just as Corinthian bronze tarnished slowly and is restored quickly, or Vitruvio said, vessel of Corinthian or any other good bronze. But uh, most of these, like oh, almost all of the texts talk about Corinthian bronze that is amazing for their workmanship. So for the chasing and for the uh, beauty of the shiny surfaces, that does not make me think of a black patinated objects. I reproduced Pausania um, recipe. So I heated red hot the eight alloys and plunged into water. And there was no black patina on copper gold or copper gold silver alloy. Actually, the gold here, the uh, cross section of in a SEM is what that touch the patina from the substrate. Uh, the, I also tried different tin composition and blacks, black patina is created if tin is more than 5% and the mineral is tenorite. So Pausani is likely not to talk about a black bronze alloy on a copper gold uh, alloy, but either a thermal patination or just a normal quenching of a bronze. Finally, Zosimos, uh, we don't know how much of the text is original and how much is an addition or an update. Uh, the, res the response to this question is even more complicated as I initially based my research on an English translation made by Hunter. However, I reviewed this with Matteo Martelli, professor of history of science, and there are missing recipes in the English version and um, missing part of recipes. Um, for example, in one, part missing from uh, the English text, the author talks about the names of few Egyptian artisans who knew the methods or Egyptian terms. And this indicates a, a close relation, a, a true translation with the original. Inaccurate translation also creates issue at the moment of the reproduction of the recipes. For example, the third recipes in the English uh, version called How to Dye a Black a bronze black is actually three different recipes. And it's clearly, the, each recipe is clearly marked by a red uh, marker, a sear, which means recipes. Um, other, uh, another issue is the term armicon, translated in the English as salt ammoniac. However, uh, the salt ammoniac was used from 9th, 10th century. So when found in older Syriac sources, like this one, is translated as azurite, which is a really different material. Other uh, inaccuracy are the use of the term copper or bronze indistinctively, while in Syriac there, are, there is no difference between the two terms. So in our experiment, we tried salt ammoniac and azurite, 
with different processes when where the text was not clear for a total of 16 experiment and none of them um, was none of the patina was black so to conclude this shows the danger of inaccurate translation and necessity not only to translate a Syriac test into another language here English but to make a comparison with the Greek language from which it was originally translated know the social context the language and the symbols used by the alchemist and the uh, know the history of the material used by the makers. I then uh, took a really uh, direct approach, went to Greece and analyzed 500 objects excavated in Corinth, uh, both, <laughs> uh, both vessel, vase, but also other types of, um, I, no, it doesn't go, uh, uh, as other uh, typologies, and uh, none of them contain any gold. I also analyzed gold to see if it was gilded to look at other, um, one of the other hypotheses. And yeah, no gold was found. And tin above 50% was only found on statuette, uh, ju jewelry, uh, vase, and, uh, and vessels. So I still have to to go through these uh, results, um, but it's an interesting uh, thing to be look at. So to conclude, um, I I think that uh, the use of scientific approach based on modern material science, an experimental plan, analytical techniques allowed a characterization of the composition structure uh, properties of different patinas. I also, I didn't show here, but um, propose an explanation of the different physical chemical processes behind the formation of the patina in the four technology tested. Well, we still need to focus on the patina more than on the alloy. So future work, um, uh, hopefully uh, with Ford will, um, will be done in the fall and uh, consist in characterized with focus ion beam and TM uh, experimental and uh, Japanese patinas. So um, this work confirmed the importance of color as a driver of artisanal knowledge uh, and contributed to the understanding of the material practice described in historiographic sources with the hope that it can provide a stimulus for a more history and material grounded translation of text which will no doubt require collaboration among specialists. It also highlighted the difficulties in working with recipes, texts, and uh, translation in general. Finally, but um, this uh, after our dinner yesterday and discussion at the table, uh, <laughs> probably uh, I will need to change this, but the analysis of Eastern artifacts together with information is in uh, written sources confirm the presence of a well established tradition uh, and is also consistent with um, transmission of the technology between Japan to China. Conversely, the attribution of Western artifact to the class of intentionally patinated artifact is in a few um, instances uh, questionable. And even if it's clear that there is patination in antiquity, uh, the variability of the composition and um, the different patina suggests the lack of a standardized tradition using established and well accepted recipes. This makes really unlikely that all the black bronzes artifacts derive from a single invention as previously proposed and therefore called into question the existence of a black class, black bronze as a well-defined class of alloys. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping us to tease this complex subject further apart. And um, I look forward to our discussions. But now it is my great pleasure to introduce Alessandra Jumlia Maya for, sadly, already <laughs> a summary and reflections on the Menza Iziaka, um, which will 
conclude our lecture program of this symposium. You may over the <laughs> it is it is your show, Alessandra. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Uh, Fourteen years ago, when I examined the Mensa Isiaca, I thought I was never going to see anything like it again. Fourteen years later, I still believe it. The Mensa Isiaca is a unique piece. As the Gonzaga Duke said, a rare and unique piece. I have been studying uh, patinated alloys for over 30 years. I began when I was at university, and now I'm more or less retiring. Um, at the time, um, Paul Craddock was my supervisor, and uh, he had identified one piece, one Roman piece, uh, which was similar to Shakudo. And he thought it might have been the uh, mysterious uh, Corinthian alloy and asked me to, to help with this uh, research. So I did, and uh, that's how I began. And uh, after I um, finished university, I uh, moved all over the place, actually, to Germany, to Austria, to, to Austria first, to Germany afterwards with my family, and I tried to continue by myself. Um, it has not been easy because I've mo I was moving all the time, and also because of the many problems which this material presents, of course. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that we are having a workshop here on these kind of materials. I think it is uh, an excellent idea, and I think uh, Susanne and friends did a wonderful job with the Mensa, uh, which, uh, well, look at this uh, uh, map, uh, false color map. Um, you can see a lot of uh, different details and also how the corrosion uh, is visible on top of the, of the inlays. You can see uh, everywhere here uh, the cuprite on top of the, um, of the, the various inlays. Um, I wonder if this bluish um, shade here, I know that it is the tin, I wonder if it is a redeposition of tin on the surface as well. Um, the, um, the lead um, map is also quite interesting. Uh, I was looking at uh, spots where the inlays are missing, and I can see uh, more white in those places. Uh, more white means more lead, of course. So I was wondering if there hasn't, hasn't been some repair in, that pla in those places, if there is really more lead in the, inside the, the keying of the inlays because of these uh, white spots all over the place here. You can see where uh, inlays are missing for the, for, uh, from the keying. You can see the white spots. So maybe the inlays fell out and they were replaced with a solder or something. It could be. The silver and gold uh, map is fantastic. Uh, it is uh, really uh, amazing how uh, you can see how much gold has been used for, this, uh, for the main seziaca. Um, but the gold is everywhere except where you would expect it, which, which is the jewelry. Um, the color of Isis, for example, uh, the color of uh, Horus here, there is no gold in there. Uh, the gold is all in the black patinated material. So, uh, yeah, it's quite uh, important to, uh, to look out for minor elements or trace elements as well. 
uh, these were, um, yeah, uh, during my research in the many years, I, when I could, I took drilled samples. I took real samples from the objects to have a proper analysis of the bulk metal. Uh, these are the most ancient statuettes, the most ancient pieces I have been able to find. I don't think there are older ones, older than this. Uh, this was in the um, Ortiz collection in Geneva, and this is the crocodile, the famous crocodile from Munich, uh, from the Egyptian uh, Samlung in Munich. Um, these are also the only pieces which are completely made of this alloy, of this patinated alloy. Uh, I don't know of any other uh, pieces made completely of this uh, gold-containing alloy. Uh, normally, the pieces are only inlaid uh, with, um, uh, with this material. For example, these ones, you see the collar. The collar is inlaid in, the, uh, in normal bronze. Uh, maybe uh, the statuette in the Metropolitan is made completely of this alloy. But uh, yeah, this is the only other example I remember. I don't know of any other ones. Um, yes, the, uh, the collars, I, uh, all inlaid, so the only way to analyze them was a non-destructive method. For example, the scanning electron microscope. Uh, however, this was not always an option because you have to bring the pieces to the, the lab. And also, the objects are mostly bigger than the chamber of the microscope, so you cannot really use them. Uh, so the only way was using XRF at the time. Um, I began 94 uh, with experiments with patinated alloys at the uh, Kunst Academy of uh, Art Academy of Nuremberg uh, with students. Uh, so the first experiments were these. Uh, these are the results of the first experiments. You can see some patination. I was very proud of it because uh, we could even get different colors. Uh, purple, black, blue, black, it was very clear. Um, they are not very pretty, I can uh, admit that, of course. Uh, this was the second uh, kind of experiment later. Uh, these are cast pieces and hammered, uh, while these ones were rolled, which is not a good idea because, uh, because the metal structure um, shows afterwards stripes on the patina, simply that. Um, well, these pieces, these samples, uh, my experiments, are small, were small, so I could put them in the chamber of the scanning electron microscope and I could look at the um, uh, structure of the metal, I could look at the growth of the, uh, the patina and also uh, crystals or whatever and the uh, uh, texture of the patina. You can see it is very uh, solid, very compact. Uh, this is a cut piece. These are the traces of my cut. So the patina didn't break in this case. And also here, this is also a very, very compact patina. Um, I was very worried about, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say a very important thing. Um, in the scanning electron microscope, the analysis did not show any um, minor elements. Um, and also the XRF results were not perfect. N not, I knew uh, what these pieces were, I knew what was inside, so I was not happy with the results. So I asked help from uh, Professor Michel Jandin uh, from the Ecole de Mie in, in Paris. He is one of the leading experts uh, for surface analysis, surface 
studies in general, uh, particularly metals, of course. Um, these were his uh, analyses. In this case, we have 1% of gold, 1% of silver, 2% of tin in copper, and only gold showed up. In this case, we had copper, 1% of gold, 1% of silver, only copper showed up. And in this case, we had 3% of gold in the alloy and only copper showed up. Uh, the patina structure is very, very compact and solid. It is cuprite. Um, common cuprite has a columnar structure. It is fragile and friable. It is not stable at all. This is the picture which uh, everybody is showing uh, of the common uh, cuprite. Um, Murakami, uh, 1988, and this is a fragment of uh, my one of my uh, samples, a fragment of the patina. You can see it is very compact. Now, if you think of the problems we have when cuprite is on the surface, it is quite clear that there are problems with uh, this kind of patina. That was the reason why we couldn't see anything uh, in the scanning electron microscope. So we also did atomic force microscopy to study the topography of the patina and um, find out what, um, what something about it, what could we do about it. Uh, we found out that there were different planes of cuprite growing out of the scratches uh, we had made on the surface, polishing the material. Um, and of course, the scratches had different di directions. They were not regular, clearly. Uh, so this uh, cuprite was growing isotropically. Uh, the planes were growing into each other. And that's why this patina is so compact and stable. Um, the only way we, we had at the time to solve the problem of these invisible um, elements was uh, to narrow down the beam and enhance the time, the measuring time, and also proper standards of these alloys were required. It was very important to have proper standards. Okay. Um, I had my experimental samples. All of them have a different composition. Uh, this was the second batch I had. We continued afterwards, of course. Uh, we did uh, a lot more experiments. Um, uh, this is also, these are also uh, samples with arsenic and iron. Uh, and I wanted to have arsenic and iron in the um, material, in the alloy, because of the uh, Japanese um, recipes, uh, which uh, underline many times, I'm thinking about the study of Denso Uno. It's a very important study, uh, which appeared uh, in the um, 1920s in German. Um, and it is um, the first person, I think, who studied this kind of um, uh, metals, alloys, and also the effect of the um, uh, trace elements, if you want to call them trace, um, a small amount of arsenic and a small amount of uh, iron, particularly iron. He was particularly interested in iron. Um, because he said they have uh, a, a direct effect on the color of the patina, on the bluish color in particular, or the purple color. I suppose uh, Ford will agree. Uh, we will see. Uh, yeah. So I used, sorry, I used these pieces. I cut a piece from them. You can see the cut. I analyzed them again because I was worried about the material not 
being the same anymore after casting and after working with it, uh, some of the uh, elements might have been lost, like arsenic, like uh, tin and, and lead as well. So I analyzed them again, and I have been using these um, samples as standards ever since, since many, many years. Uh, yes, the size of the Mensa Isiaca also was a challenge for my equipment. Uh, by the way, I did not use a handheld uh, XRF at all. Um, I think you wrote that I uh, used a handheld uh, pistol, the broker or something. I didn't. Uh, this was the equipment. Uh, you can see it uh, consists of different parts. Uh, large uh, transformer, a stabilizer, of course the computer which controls uh, various uh, operations, the head of the um, the head of the um, the system, uh, the source of uh, x-rays and you see the Mensa here. This was the analysis of the Mensa at the time, 14 years ago. Um, so I had to adapt the head of the uh, XRF on a slide to reach the inlays, which of course does not uh, improve probably, probably the, the analysis, but that's how I could work at the time. So uh, this is the analysis. I had to, I had to fish out my uh, old pigs. Uh, and I'm using uh, the, sec the third, the fourth actually, uh, equipment now. It's different from the one I was using at the time. And that's why the peaks are not, don't look very, uh, yeah, nice. Uh, but um, because I'm using the wrong program for it, I haven't got the, the old program anymore. Anyway, this is the, uh, the composition of the face of Isis, you can see it is an excellent uh, silver alloy with a huge uh, silver peak and a small copper peak. Uh, copper has a much um, weaker, sorry, copy, uh, silver has a much weaker uh, signal than copper. Uh, the, the copper signal is much stronger. So this is only three uh, or four percent of uh, copper. Uh, this is the color, which was brass. Uh, you can see the zinc, uh, the, there was some lead, there was some arsenic and whatever. Uh, yeah, that's it, I think. Um, yeah, this was the color of the first figure at the top of the Mensa. And you can see it is a very, very different alloy. You have a lot of copper here. Uh, we, so part of it probably comes from corrosion, but I tried to find the ones which were was cleaner than the other ones. Uh, you see the peak of silver, which is very small. There is something else here, which I ignored at the time, but we are going to talk about it. There is arsenic, some gold. This is the second peak, to, uh, peak sorry, uh, the second peak of arsenic. Um, there is no lead. It, I thought at first this would be uh, the lead peak, but it is um, because there are no other peaks, of course. And lead has a very strong signal. Uh, this is the face of base, uh, first on the, uh, on the face here, and you can see there is some tin in there. Uh, zinc as well, uh, some, some arsenic and gold, and this is the second measurement I did on the nose because I thought it was cleaner, but it wasn't. You can see the white spot here, which is the calcium you see here. Uh, what I want to point out is the lead uh, diminished. I mean, in, in this place, the lead was lower. However, the uh, uh, gold and arsenic uh, stayed the same. They are small peaks, but they are there. So it's a strange alloy, very strange. Um, this is the enlarged, these are the, these, uh, this is this peak here. I only enlarged it uh, just to show the tin. And, the, cop, uh, the calcium on top of it. So we have three peaks on top of each other in this place. Uh, 
In the literature, I've been looking at uh, measurements of Roman silver, a lot of them, um, particularly hordes, but not only hordes, also minor groups, also um, single uh, silver objects. The lead and gold content are lower than in the silver uh, of the main Zeaca, and um, in this period, silver, the gold was always removed from the silver. So it's not a usual alloy at all. We are dealing with very strange alloys. As I said, uh, we have many colors uh, which have never been seen before in other places, except for the one strigilis which uh, Sophie and uh, colleagues found in the Louvre. Um, and, uh, well, we have the red alloys, of course, which are the red patinated alloys. So there are many uncommon alloys. Also, the silver alloys are not the usual ones. Uh, what I thought is that there is a connection with the Alexandrian school because at the time um, we, we, we have a lot of um, recipes and descriptions from this time. Uh, the new material was brass. The material which was used for the mensa and was completely new for the period is brass. And perhaps it is important to check where it came from. Uh, the earliest use, regular use of brass uh, were the coins of Nicomedes IV of Bithynia. Now, um, Julius Caesar, when he was a young man, was sent to Bithynia as ambassador in 80 BC. And he stayed, stayed there for several years so that there was even gossip, there were rumors about his homosexual relationship with uh, Nicomedes IV. Uh, so much so that even during the triumphs in Rome, his soldiers were mocking him about the story with Nicomedes. So he knew about the coins, he had seen them, they looked as like gold, but they were not gold. Um, the earliest Roman coins made of brass were emitted by Julius Caesar in 44 BC in Macedonia and also in Egypt, uh, where his legati were, and also later in Noricum and uh, Gaul in Gallia, where his legions were, and where we know that there were the Kalamine mines uh, at Aachen, Stolberg, and so on. Um, so uh, there must be a connection with this. Where did he get the brass from? I believe he was the one who introduced brass into uh, the Roman Empire, which was not an empire yet, of course. Uh, and his nephew, uh, Augustus, must have known this from his time and uh, emitted later, in 23 BC, uh, the Sesterzi and Dupondi of Brass, the ones we know about. So, the Alexandrian metal workers had a lot of time to experiment with the new alloys and use them for the orange and yellow patinated alloys. The red uh, does not contain zinc. Um, the Egyptomania uh, of the Romans really exploded when uh, Julius Caesar brought uh, Cleopatra to Rome. Uh, everybody wanted to meet the queen. It is known from the literature, from history. And even worse, later, when, uh, the, when Egypt became the private possession of Emperor Augustus. This is also when the cult of Isis spread out in most Roman regions, that's uh, where we get uh, Egid, the finds from Egid from, and so on. So, um, 
black patinated alloys were everywhere and always connected with the world of alchemy. Um, they are mentioned in many texts, in the Alexandrian alchemistic texts. Um, they are, there are um, places, uh, well, of course, the text of Zosimos in Syriac. Uh, there are also Chinese alchemy texts. Um, and the story of the UA family, it's also uh, a family of alchemists, and they were producing these kind of uh, alloys. In Japan, we have a similar story about the uh, Goto uh, family, who seems to have been the um, alchemists' family. Uh, they, they were trading uh, the secret of these alloys for a long time, and then it became, of course, uh, common knowledge. Um, so these texts are handbooks, uh, not uh, related to religious mysticism, like uh, medieval and Renaissance writings on alchemy at all. Um, for example, these people uh, wrote comments like, um, uh, for a kind of a gold imitation, gold-colored alloy, um, they never used the, te the term imitation, of course. Um, they said uh, this alloy can um, uh, be taken as gold even from, uh, even by, by um, uh, goldsmiths. So it can deceive goldsmiths. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were preparing alloys which looked like whatever, and yeah. So this is the Syriac translations of Zosimos, uh, not from Parnopolis, as uh, Agnese said, but from Panopolis. Um, uh, this is the chapter with the title Production of Black Metal or Corinthian Alloy. Uh, I found it many, many years ago, looking for uh, whatever texts I could find, and I found many, uh, hundreds of them actually. Um, I know uh, that uh, there are different recipes here, and I also discussed it in the in the in the book uh, I have written many years ago. Regrettably, in uh, you said I can. Okay. Um, sorry, I missed. Uh, I missed. Uh, what? Uh, yes, yes, like, uh, yes. Regrettably, I wrote it in German, so nobody read it, <laughs> or very few people. Um, definitely not uh, many people who have been dealing with with this material. Uh, so I believe that uh, this. Text have been written, has been written by Jacobite monks who uh, were uh, also, well, of course, they were alchemists, and they went as missionaries to China, like the Nestorians. It was just the same case, and it is known that they had uh, connections with Taoist monks who were also alchemists, and I believe this is how these... Uh, material came to Asia at some point, uh, brought by these missionaries. I, uh, well, been working on uh, Asian materials as well. Uh, I learned Chinese for three years to do this. And uh, I went to shipping, which should have been the main center uh, earlier on, uh, of the production of utong, which means black uh, copper. And this is uh, this monster here. It's a huge peacock with a Buddha on top uh, with some inlays, and I don't believe they are the real thing at all, um, were uh, from a foundry in Kuming. These are, uh, this is an um, uh, incense burner uh, made by the grandfather of this old man here. He was the last one. Uh, then I went to Japan, learned Japanese for two years just to uh, defend myself. 
because the first time I went, many years ago, nobody was speaking English. And this is my colleague, uh, Ota Kenichi of the Osaka University, who has been uh, help, uh, helping a lot in Japan. We also uh, wrote papers together, and together with Morimoto Yasunosuke IV, uh, who is the owner of the Morimoto Kazari, uh, this is a, a most, the most important workshop in, in Japan. They are reproducing the parts of the temples, uh, the parts of the objects in the temples for the, for the emperor. He has been very, very helpful, uh, very patient as well. And this is only a, a selection of his uh, alloys. Oh yeah, and the tools. I, uh, yes, uh, these wonderful tools they have in Japan, which uh, Ford was showing yesterday. Um, this was the last uh, step, uh, not the last I, I'm planning, but the last I did. Uh, in Korea, uh, there is a similar material which is called Dodong. And uh, well, you can see the workshop here and uh, we could, um, it, it, it is going to be published soon. Um, they are still producing these pipes uh, in, uh, in Korea. So it's the only place I know of where they are still producing this material. This has been, of course, my, my uh, trips to Asia have been very, very helpful to understand more uh, of this material. Uh, what else can we do to better understand the Menseziaca? Which kind of non-destructive analysis? We were talking yesterday with uh, Ernst. Uh, he was suggesting to use um, um, uh, laser abrasion on the inlays, which would be fantastic, of course. Um, of course, more studies of objects would be quite good to do, if possible, if more can be found, because there are not many around. I'm, I've been looking for them for 30 years, as I said, or longer. Uh, I'm sure you have been looking for more, but you couldn't find any new ones. You have, you listed the ones I had published, so um, Sophie also doesn't uh, know of any new ones. Uh, they are difficult to find. I have found a lot of black patinated ones. Uh, many uh, have not been published yet, but not the orange and red, uh, red, yes, but not the orange and yellow ones. Particularly the yellow one is a problem for me personally, because um, I could not uh, reproduce this kind of alloy. So. Uh, since uh, 2017, I have a project, a patination project, at the Sitterwerk foundry in Switzerland. Um, this is the, uh, the foundry, of course. Um, it's quite a big one. It is the most important um, uh, metal foundry for uh, art work. They have been uh, casting uh, statues and artwork for the MoMA, for the... Uh, Tate Gallery, and whatever you can think of. They have a branch in China, here, and they also cast uh, the huge teddy bear which is sitting at the airport uh, of Doha. So Tilo has seen it, for sure. Uh, so it's huge. Um, and they also do uh, other more traditional stuff, of course. This is uh, one of the workers who is casting my, one of my uh, alloys, and we are patinating here. Uh, this is one of the preparations of the uh, three, actually, three different alloys with, uh, with gold, the casting, rolling. I don't like uh, rolled samples, as I said before, because there are problems, but in the foundry, we can find a way to uh, uh, correct the properties, of course, of the metal. Um, we polish uh, the, the samples, uh, with uh, partly with um, tools, whatever machines, but we also do it by hand. I'm using a piece of um, um, uh, canelian, 
which is what was used in antiquity, and it works perfectly well. Uh, I get fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, patina with carnelian. Uh, this is Anita. She's um, punching the single, all, all single pieces of um, all, all samples with a letter or two or whatever, what is necessary, and numbers so that we don't mix them. Uh, and every stage is photographed. Uh, then everything is written down in a journal, of course, by hand and afterwards on the computer. And we also use these tables where uh, we have the um, uh, composition, the, uh, the alloy, the um, surface treatment, the uh, solution, and so on, and comments and whatever. Every uh, piece is put in a bag with, with a tag, of course. So we reproduce the alloys identified on the main Cisiaca. This is the uh, all phases of the orange patinated alloy. Uh, as you can see, it's quite quite a good. Uh, yeah, it worked very well. The patina is very compact, a very nice um, piece. Uh, they stay in the archive in the foundry. They are not used, but we have a lot of other ones, of course, which we use for experiments. Um, yes, the yellow patina, uh, the yellow uh, patinated alloy, as I said, uh, did not develop a patina as we wanted it. I don't know why. I probably did something wrong. I don't know. But we uh, need to experiment more with it. So these are the colors of the main uh, You see the black. Uh, I'm sorry about the photograph. There is a reflection. It's, it doesn't show the colors perfectly. But it is really very red, very orange. You have seen it. This is the yellow one, which we don't like. Uh, this is one uh, piece which uh, has been cut in three pieces. This is the original color before patination. And you can see uh, if it is treated in different ways and different solution, you can get very different results, different colors. So uh, the main side has possibly never, this, this is not um, real anymore, actually, because I wanted to ask if it is possible to clean the white spots I had seen at the time on the Mensa, but I think they have been cleaned now. I've seen it yesterday, so forget <laughs> about it. Uh, thank you for your attention.